Awesome. All right, I'll jump right into this. Um, I'm going to go over some of the software simulation capabilities that we have here at IVNV that we've developed with the independent test capability team. So we'll start off with an introduction to software-only simulation, um, some of the processes um, that are involved. I'll give an introduction to the independent test capability team, and we'll discuss some of the uh, spacecraft simulators that we've developed, and we'll close with some lessons learned. So software-only simulation, what is it? Software-only simulation is a complete model of a spacecraft. All of the um, processor boards, FPGAs, COM cards, space instruments, um, all that stuff, we model them all and they come together to form a complete spacecraft simulator. So basically, it's a, a software-only simulation, but it thinks it's the real satellite. So with this, we can control the CPU execution, timing, uh, we can look at memory. And this can be used for IVNV, and since it actually thinks that it's a um, spacecraft, it can be used for operator training. So here's a couple of use cases. Uh, you can see that the modeled spacecraft hardware is separate from the flight software. We run flight software unmodified on a uh, instructor set simulator. So we can run uh, power PCs, Leons, different types of spacecraft. And we also run the same ground system that you would typically see. Um, so for in the case of like GPM, uh, we were running assist. So for independent testers, you can halt execution, you can inject faults, uh, you can perform memory analysis. With uh, operators, you can you know, perform spacecraft scenario and do operator training. Our first step in development is scoping the system that we need to test. So we will take a look at the requirements, uh, what all we need, and we have an iterative process of planning and analysis in which we, uh, we start out, we build a very basic system that will run the flight software, and then through iterations and releases, we can model more and more of the hardware and augment you know, functionality that's needed for testers. Um, so we don't simulate everything at once and release one big uh, project. We you know, go through iterations and release more and more uh, with each time. So the ITC team, we, uh, well, I'll start with our charter. Um, our charter is to acquire, develop, and manage adaptable test environments that are allow the dynamic analysis of software behaviors for multiple missions. We perform this dynamic analysis on the actual flight software so we can verify the behavior of that software. We develop simulators, and to do this, we need a wide range of employees. So we have experts in hardware modeling, we have experts in simulators. We have experts in software integration. Um, so we have a, a very distributed team, and uh, each of us brings you know, something different to the table to help put these simulators together. We also support the JSTAR, the John McBride Software Testing and Research Laboratory. This is where we do our deployments, uh, well, one of the areas that we do our deployments. Uh, so we deploy our simulators to the JSTAR, and we also support um, government off-the-shelf simulators for different projects. Our server racks, um, we can use virtual deployments for all the machines that are in there, but we also have hardware in the loop capabilities. So we have different um, flight processors, uh, RAD 750s, Leon processors. We have uh, 1553 networks, space wire networks. So we can provide a bunch of different um, capabilities right within the JSTAR other than our software only simulation. Here's an example of one of our deployments. Um, this is GoSim. GoSim is the uh, GPM operational simulator. Getting away from the mic. Sorry. Um, this simulator consists of four different VMs. So the benefit to using these separate VMs is that each of these components have a native host that they're meant to run on. So instead of editing all this software, we just run it on virtual machines. So in this case for GPM, um, Assist is our ground station. GDS is the Goddard Dynamic Simulator that makes the simulation think that it's actually flying. The build environment is where we host all of our models for uh, system, so I mean, system models, um, FPGA cards, the like. And the flight software VM is where we actually run the unmodified flight software binaries. So with these four VMs, we can model the entire system and it thinks that it's a, a working satellite. So some of the technologies that we've developed in-house, 
the main backbone to all of these simulators is the NASA Operational Simulator. We refer to it as NAS. Um, this is a software-only architecture that is uh, easily deployed through virtual machines. It provides dynamic interception capabilities so we can monitor bus traffic and um, intercept messages, change messages. Um, it's reusable, so you'll see in some of these uh, future uh, projects that I'll go through um, that we use NAS for all of these. It's the core of all of our simulators. And it's a layered architecture and uh, kind of easy to visualize through some of these uh, graphics. Uh, open all these up here. So we have plug and play hardware models. Um, different simulators require different things. So we have models written for different processors, uh, different FPGAs. Uh, we use the ground, sim ground system that's meant for each individual satellite. Uh, we have bus monitoring capability as well as uh, interception. We can monitor the traffic and uh, view it. Um, and again, this is really easy to deploy and maintain through virtual machines. So. Our middleware. Some of the uh, features are it's cross-platform. We can run it on many different hosts. Um, has a very robust API that gives us access to 1553 space wire, um, the street, sim street signals. It also uh, supports time synchronization, so we can use this middleware to drive the timing of the spacecraft. We don't have to rely on, um, you know, the timing of the the actual host computer. We can say, you know, execute at this order. Um, and again, it allows interception for IV and G. We can stop execution, view the traffic, uh, view what's in memory, and uh, you know stress the system that's under test. So it's very reusable. We uh, use it for all of our simulators. And here is our layered architecture. You can see the system under test. That would be the models and the flight software that we're testing. Um, the light blue layer there is our APIs. And uh, the red layer would be the actual NOS core that does all the uh, bus monitoring and interception. Um, we have a little block on the side there that says additional protocols as needed. Right now, most of us uh, are just using 1553 and SpaceWire, but we could add in additional stuff for uh, SPI, I2C, uh, whatever we need. Some of the user utilities that are available through NOS are a virtual oscilloscope. So you can view the signals at a board level. We also have virtual 1553 with a uh, PASH 3200 emulator. Uh, this virtual 1553 bus can be used as a VC, an RT, bus monitor. We can do all of those. And we also have a virtual space wire router that performs much like the uh, 1553 bus would. You can view the traffic in between each. So here is a, excuse me, here is a, um, normal data flow through a system, NOS being our middleware. Uh, node A and Node B you could think of as, you know, say a, a, a BC and an RT uh, on 1553. So normally the data would just pass straight through the middleware. Um, no pauses, I uh, wouldn't even know that the middleware is there. With interception, Node A would pass into the middleware, the interceptor could grab that data, view it, and then pass it back to the RT. And again, the RT wouldn't know anything different. We can also modify the data at the interceptor level. So when data passes to the interceptor, we could grab it, modify it, and then send it to the RT. So this gives us the ability to inject faults or you know, make sure that things happen as they should. Or we can block it all together. So from node A, we can block the signal. It'll get passed back to the middleware, and the RT receives nothing. So that gives us a bunch of IV and G options with our middleware. So spacecraft simulators. We have developed three at the moment. Um, we maintain others that weren't developed in-house, but these are our in-house simulators. So we have uh, GoSim, I discussed briefly earlier, that's a GPM operational simulator. We have the James Webb Space Telescope Simulator, uh, JIST as we refer to it, and we also did a simulator for Discover. Uh, GPM operational simulator. GoSim. This, all of our simulators are really uh, similar. Uh, you'll see this in the capability sections of each of these. But we integrate commercial off-the-shelf components, government off-the-shelf components. Um, the basic ground system, in this case, assist. Uh, these 
bass instruments that are there, uh, our NAS middleware, as always, and we have uh, custom-made hardware models for the components on GPM that uh, aren't available off the shelf. So the capabilities, again, are to run unmodified flight software. So you can test this software without really um, changing any of the flight software. So it's the same software that would go on the satellite. So it gives us a really good capability for VMB. You can uh, execute test scripts that are provided by uh, the GPM testers. Uh, you can perform single step debugging, um, you know, step by step through CPU execution. And when you halt execution, you can inject errors um, through the middleware or, I guess, in GPM's case, through the ground system. And we also got an uh, honorable mention for software of the year for GoTeam. So this simulator, uh, this architecture will be really familiar to all of these simulators. But you can see that NAS middleware is the backbone of the system. We connect all of our simulators' um, models to NAS middleware, and then we communicate with the ground system, uh, in this case, assist. So James Webb, oh, go back, that's a pretty nice picture of James Webb. Um, GIST is our most complex simulator that we have. Uh, we're still working on GIST. Um, it's, again, software only, um, very good for VNV, unmodified flight software. Um, in this case, Eclipse is the ground system that we're using. And we integrate all those components from um, the James Webb telescope. So we have uh, ISIM components, uh, et cetera. And we've modeled many of these components ourselves that weren't provided to us. So a lot of, uh, a lot of custom hardware models. Um, just in this case, added automated testing and fault-based testing. So this architecture, much like GoSim, uh, you have the Eclipse ground system that communicates with the processor boards. You can see the complexity here, though. We have three different um, processors in this system. So two RAD 750s and a PowerPC 405. Um, all of those are modeled and ran on emulators. And then we have tons and tons and tons of hardware models for GIST. Um, very complex and still in the works. So this simulator, uh, all the green components here are provided to us. Um, those are external components that we integrated. And all the blue components are models that we've developed in-house or systems that we've developed in-house. And the uh, NAS middleware in this case would be at that bus level. So 1553 base wire bus, um, the ISIM bus, which is separate. That would be where the NAS middleware links in. So again, very complex system. We also made a simulator for Discover. It's a little more simple, but same architecture as all the others. ITOF, the ground system, communicates with our models. And the light gray outline there is GDS, uh, Goddard Dynamics Simulator, which would simulate all the uh, flight conditions. So GoSim was a, uh, it was used for three years, um, IBNV, GPM, and uh, actually launch support even used GoSim. This took uh, two employees, about six months. Um, this is, that six month number is just for a basic prototype. That's not for the full blown simulator. That's for um, basic flight software running. And then we augmented that as we went on. Um, this was a medium complexity. Uh, GIST, on the other hand, so we started in 2012. This is still ongoing. Um, it took us about four months to get up and running. Very, very complex. But this shows that reusing that NOS middleware allowed us to cut our time down, even though the complexity was increased. So this is used by IVNV and uh, James Webb Test Labs. And Discover was 2013, still ongoing. Um, this one only took two months. It was low complexity, but again, reusability contributed, and we were able to push this out a little bit quicker. But it's important to note that these aren't the times for the full-blown system. These are just you know, basic CNDH, uh, getting flight software running. So lessons learned. Um, the main lesson that we've learned is reusing our middleware has saved us cost and effort as we build more and more simulators. Um, the reuse between each project has been uh, pretty good. Uh, we only have to you know, add in features as necessary. Um, automated testing and deployments have saved us a lot of time, um, so engineers can focus on more important tasks such as adding functionality or adding more models, um, looking into faults, 
So we don't spend a lot of time every time we want to deploy redoing uh, you know, stuff that we've already done before. We can automate that. The uh, hardware modeling should start out very basic um, just to execute flight software. Then you can pass that on to the testers. And from there, uh, you can augment as you need to and add more and more functionality while people are able to test. So you can get it out, let people start using it, find out what else they need, and then come back and add more to it. With hardware modeling, it's important to spend a lot of time writing unit tests in a system as big as James Webb. Um, when something goes wrong, debugging is really hard, so it's good to know that your unit tests uh, on the hardware model is passed. Um, so you spend a lot of time writing the unit tests, that's one less thing that uh, you have to debug when it comes to the simulator. And finally, um, these software simulators take a lot of time. Uh, they cost a good bit, and uh, the labor involved is pretty extensive. So this is uh, what we got. You can visit our webpage at the URL listed. Uh, Scott Zimmerick and Justin Morris are our two best points of contact, but contact us for whatever you need, and uh, we'll field some questions. I'll do my best to answer anything that's asked. This uh, topic has been presented at workshops in the past. I remember Scott Zimmerick presented uh, a topic called SimSmithing, where the idea was you take all these different modules and build your simulation or your environment based on plug and play aspect, which seems to be your strong point here. Right. That's what his whole thing was about. I think you more or less expanded on that based on the projects you've taken on since then. Yeah, um, this is much like, uh, well, we do the same thing all the time. so. Each year at workshops, I guess the presentations are uh, kind of alike. But yeah, in uh, the case of um, James Webb, you know, we uh, we already had our middleware built. So when that came along, we had uh, models built for certain flight processors. We could plug those in and run them. Um, it really contributes the sim smithing, as I guess Scott called it. Um, it's a lot easier when you have parts that are already built, um, like GES from Goddard, since that simulation is already made to simulate the satellite flying. You don't have to, you know, write your own simulator to make it fly. You can just add that component in. And uh, that's something we were fairly good at, um, getting components from other places and adding them in. And uh, we've been looking into uh, components from SLS to integrate into our simulator when that project comes along. So the reusability should be fairly, fairly good from all the simulators that we already have. So if you have to simulate another piece of hardware like different bus, architecture or different processor, that's easy to plug into your system, it looks like. Yes, very easy. I have a question about um, future work. Yeah. Um, we're looking at Hebrews right now. Uh, we're working the SPSS control, uh, SPSS project. Part of that project is uh, to control the, the Hebrew satellite. I didn't know if you guys had looked at Hebrews at all. I do not believe so. I may not be the best person to answer that, but I do not think that's in, in the works. So I'll give you a little more detail. I mean, one of the things that we need to be able to do is control the antenna, the space around antenna. Um, and, and also, there, there's a bus on there that's uh, associated with with uh, PTSDS protocol, uh, flight controller, um, and some other protocols as well. So perhaps we need to at some point talk about the details of that kind of simulation um, because we have the capability of simulating the, uh, Hebrew, the terminal, the ground terminal that communicates with Hebrew. And so um, I noticed the one chart you had at GSBO Cranford, uh, I guess, with um, KWST, is that right? Um, GSDO would be um, SLS. SLS, yeah. okay. Um, That's fine, but I mean, but the same principles. Right? Exactly, yeah. So um, we've simulated, a, like, for, for GPN, it was a assist uh, communicating uh, for uh, Discover with ICOP communicating. 
Eclipse and James Webb Space. So yeah, we, we would be able to add that in um, four different satellites. Right. So the same thing. Well, the Zara satellite. Right. So there would there would be possibly more detail. And that was one of the questions that I was um, leading up to was what level of detail. It's not just a black box for the work here, right? Or it's not just a black box to do the work here. Necessarily, and this is, this is the question: Is is there more detail built into the JWST simulation than than just the data that you would have in Hunter Group? Well, in that simulator, um, we tried to model all of the uh, well. That's a couple of different isolated systems that communicate through our middleware. So um, we could use, um, in this case, uh, iSim communicates with uh, you know JCAM. Overseas spacecraft, so we can add all of our our middleware does all that communications for us. We don't have to add in that component. The only thing that we have to add are the hardware models that we don't have. Um, and then, in the case of communication to the ground station, um, we just use the ground station that we provided to connect to Eclipse and Space uh, for James Webb. And then that would communicate with a uh, modeled um, communications uh, test model that we could. You know, we had, we had been discussing this a little bit with um, with ITC a couple of years ago, and uh, probably need to talk about it again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. This is just a little more of a scope question. I noticed one of the simulators was software only, and then I hear you talking software and hardware. What percentage of software only simulators are you involved in? I mean, the software simulators that we develop, uh, the three I discussed, those uh, all three are software only simulators. Um, so it's full software. It'll run on all virtual machines. Um, you have no need for hardware in the loop capability whatsoever. Um, but we do provide hardware in the loop um, at the JSTAR. Our in house developed software simulators aren't the only thing that we work on. Uh, we also have external simulators that we run. And we provide the hardware in the loop capability. So we're working on a few different projects right now. Um, in the case of like CFD um, flight software, running that on hardware, um, and then you know we can take components that are modeled in hardware for the software-only simulators, um, unplug them, and then plug in hardware to you know prove, hey, our models are doing what we what we want them to do. Um, so that's a goal. But of the three we discussed, um, pure software. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you all.